but the thing is, I actually when I started, it was really sort of like a mentality already that it's gonna be a tough road. So I would just say that your fears were warranted. <laughs> <laughs> You are listening to In Good Company, a podcast that explores the lives, businesses, careers, and advocacies of people who want to create positive impact in the world. If you're someone who's looking for inspiration, positive stories, how-tos, and opportunities to start a business or pursue a career with meaning and purpose, this podcast is for you. And we won't just be talking about the good and inspiring stuff. We'll be talking about the real stuff, which means that we'll get into the gritty, grimy, and yes, juicy details about trying to do good in a world where doing good is still a bit of an afterthought. This podcast is designed to share inspiring stories, but at the same time encourage anyone. But while doing good in a big way is challenging, it is possible, and there are concrete and actionable steps to do so. So if you want to do good, you're in good company. I'm Reese Fernandez Ruiz, co founder and president of Rags to Riches. And I'm Tom Graham, author of the book The Genius of the Poor and co founder of the social tourism enterprise Make a Difference Travel. And, and this, this is, is In Good, Good company. company. Mark Ruiz made a lot of safe choices growing up from where to go for college, what course to take, and what job to apply for. He chose mostly the safest options. So when he decided to leave a successful career in a multinational company, he did it with a clear mind, strong determination, and for the right reasons. Our guest today is Mark Ruiz, president and co-founder of Happinoy, and he'll be talking about his life, advocacies, how he made the jump from corporate to social entrepreneurship, and why he did it. Hey Mark, how are you doing? Hey Tom, I'm good. Excellent. Hi. Yeah. Hi, I Reese. think I know you. Yeah. You Can know, I just start? Familiar. Yeah. I, I just want to start this interview okay. with the gossip. Now, right. I've, I've heard <laughs> on the grapevine okay. that you are, in fact, married to Reese. And I would like to know are you willing to confirm or deny these allegations? Uh, that's going to be tough. You're putting me on the spot, Tom. What we're, do you think? We're here to get the. Uh, uh, did we suddenly own up to this thing? Um, the rumors I, I, are like. I don't know. I, we have a son, so okay. All right. Um, all right. Yeah, he, he'll yeah, be yeah, in yeah. my custody. All right. Like yeah. the whole marriage. Talk, okay. I know. Looks better. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I think I think I should admit it. I think um, you know, okay. gotta nail this one down. All right. <laughs> uh, gestures at Reese. <laughs> Not at Tom. Yes. Okay. Not at Tom. Okay. Rumor number two. Okay. Is it true? Okay. That you were in fact uh-huh. the. Professor or the teacher of oh. Reese during her time at university, and you had some kind of interactions back then which led to said marriage. Oh, can you okay. confirm or deny? That one is a you have to explain it. That one needs a little bit, yeah, yeah. That one need, would need a little bit more elaboration because yeah. that one is sort of like easy to spin off as a uh, fake news. Oh, okay, all right, all right. yeah, yeah, but, but it is true, it is true. We did meet in university, people actually think we're classmates. But I will no, they don't. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I didn't uh, think that. But we, can, <laughs> but we can now own up to it, I guess. But that time, nothing. Nothing at all. In yeah. Fact, in fact, he gave me a B plus. I'm sorry. That, that's low Ooh, for me in that semester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. It is actually right. my claim to fame is that in that semester, it was the only B plus that Reese got. She yeah. got all A's in all her other subjects. Yeah. Yeah. You put it I down know. to earth, huh? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, I was <laughs> running after a grade, so don't worry. I'm not this like super, super smart ace everywhere. I was just running after like an honors class during that yeah. time. Actually, during that class, we actually went to Payaras together yes. with Father Javi and then reconnected half a year after she graduated. Yeah. And uh, that was the time that we said, you know, we sort of like have to pursue this thing in Payatas. Didn't have full on name then. Father Javi was still in the community. This was a social mission, yeah. not a love affair. No. That one was sort of like emerged as okay. part of the... Came later. Uh, it, it, came, it, uh, came it came much it, later, it, actually. Uh, it was a very big perk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Up here. Appears with Reese. <laughs> I have to visualize for your listeners. Oh my God. I am regretting this. I, I am regretting this. <laughs> I so, give us a little bit of a background. So, you worked for Unilever, 
Yeah. Um, and then did some teaching, I guess, at Athenaeo, right? Yes. Today, you are the co-founder of Enoi. Yeah. Just give us a little bit of a background to your story and how did you end up becoming a social entrepreneur? Yeah, so after the, my story is kind of uh, funny because like ever since I was young, sort of like just follow a certain mold, you know, sort of, in my head, it, there was always just a template that I was following and sort of like what my parents were grooming to become. And again, it wasn't like they were forcing me into it, but it was sort of like an assumed template that I would get into a good university and then so get into a good course. So I took up a business course. Right. When I chose that course, it was management engineering. And very simple criteria is like what kind of course will actually land me, you know, the best corporate job and then get into a big company and then work my butt off for 30, 40 years, retire with a big, just live off the beach with my wife and kids. And so that was sort of like when I see the template, sort of like that kind of trajectory. Pretty much that was what I was following. Did go into ME, did graduate and was very fortunate enough to get a chance to work in Unilever. Some of you might have heard of this smallish company. Yeah, and then spent seven years in that company. But you know, probably in the fifth year that I was working in Unilever, sort of like an itch was sort of like starting to scratch. The best thing about this itch was that I was genuinely not sad or dissatisfied satisfied with my work in Unilever. In fact, you know, that was such, I look at it with such fond memories. You know, working in a multinational is so challenging, so exciting. Every day is just like, you know, you've got your battle gear, you're off to win in the market and all of these things. And it's, it's so much fun. And yeah. there was just something missing. And it was like, hey, what's that? I wanted to do something quote unquote more meaningful. Here was the point that I just basically started volunteering and sort of like trying to scratch its itch, figuring out what to do. And so volunteered with different organizations and pretty much sort of like plotting out my next steps. I volunteered actively for Life's Directions, uh, Agimat, National Youth Commission, and then sort of like realized that, you know, I wanted to do something, you know, for the country, mm -hmm. for the poor. I blame my dress with education and then resign now for the benefit of, of the people who are listening in terms of the thought process of how that, yeah. that came about. So I got exposed to microfinance. And I read this couple of very influential books in my life. Actually, three. Three books. One was Making a Life, Making a Living by Mark Albion. Very successful corporate guy and basically said, I want to do something more meaningful and wanted to merge business principles. So he left and then started this whole movement around that. Because I love business. Doesn't mean I have to give that up uh, to, me, to be fulfilled. So that was one. The other was How to Change the World, which was this book about Ashoka, social entrepreneurs. And so that was my first exposure to these people trying to change the world. And of course, that was really inspiring. The third was Banker to the Poor. And this was the book about Dr. Muhammad Yunus. He basically had built an entire movement, microfinance, which is absolutely the founder similar. of microfinance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He started in Bangladesh and, and grew it into a global movement. And those three books sort of like said, okay, I wanted to do something. It has to be a business, but at its core DNA it has to help. These were the major influences. It wasn't an easy thing. Going through that discernment was also a spiritual journey. I was very fortunate because I have a very uh, friend and spiritual director, Father Ted Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And he runs this retreat called Life's Directions. And that really helped me process all of these things. But it wasn't automatic. It's like when I attended the retreat, it still took me more than a year before I resigned. I do remember that exact moment when I was really time to go. I was in Chicago. Unilever had sent me to attend this global thing with people all around the world. So I, I was representing Asia that time. Uh, myself and another uh, person from China. So there's, I think, around 12 of us in Chicago in Hamburger University, Donald's and and basically, this was the global customer marketing. I was very fortunate to be there because as around me were all of these like more senior people in Unilever globally. And I look, if I work really hard, in 10 years, I could be that guy, you know, zooming all around the world with a gigantic corporate package and, uh -huh. you know, the real nice car, really nice house. Yeah. yeah, I could be that guy. I could be that person in 10 years. And quite frankly, I was thinking to myself, if I work really, really hard, I could probably do it in five. And I said, that's not what I wanted. That's not the future state I wanted. What's it about these guys that yeah. made you think I don't want that? No, they, well, actually, they, uh, nothing or... against it because they were actually absolutely very successful. Yeah. They were, you know, at the peak of their careers. Yeah. I'm not saying that's wrong. I think that's a perfectly fine path to endeavor in. In fact, I'm sure they're doing a lot of good all around the world. It just wasn't what I wanted. It being like global director wasn't who I wanted to become in, in five years. Uh, the line that stuck in my head was, no amount of walking on the wrong road will get you where you really mm. want to go. And if you realize that, no amount of walking in the wrong road will get you where you want to go then why are you still on that road got back home in manila i drafted that resignation letter yeah and i'm, I'm such a nerd actually trying to avoid all of these people asking me these questions because quite honestly it was the last thing people would expect because because my career was doing kind of well kind of okay so i didn't want to go through this entire process of explaining myself over and over again so i prepared like several page document frequently asked questions and it's the same document i gave to my parents when i had to explain that i wanted to resign and so like are you just burned out 
no, I'm not, blah, blah, blah. So these kinds of questions that I sort of... All fuck. included in your resignation letter. Yeah, yeah, it's like an attachment. Yes. That is very nerdy. <laughs> very it is very nerdy. It is very nerdy. <laughs> it is very nerdy. Kudos to my management engineering background and to the corporate training that Unilever gave me to be so methodical about it. Don't get me started on the other documents I had prepared. Okay. Yeah. When I was playing around with the idea, I think I was around 24, 25. Okay. And I did, I left when I was 29. 29. 29. All right. So you and did about six or seven years from your yeah. early 20s until 20 years. Yes. Yeah. For some of our listeners who are perhaps yeah. in their early 20s, yeah. uh, do you think it's a good idea to go down that corporate route, experience it, to get to really see that side of things and then pursue something like social entrepreneurship? Yeah. I think each person would have their own paths. But speaking from my experience, I think it's uh, it's been very valid. If you ask me, I think I stayed too long. Right now, given the pace of things, five years would just be the right amount. You could probably jettison out of there as early as four years, but five years would be a nice round number okay. for you to sort of like absorb the learnings. Seven gives you enough of a track record though, but a five, get away with it. And so today you're the co-founder of Happy Noi. Yeah. Unlike other people we've had on the show that have products uh, yeah. or services that they specifically sell, I've slightly struggled to understand exactly what Happy Noi does. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and, and what your daily life is like within yeah. Happy Noi. So can you just tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah. So Happy Noi has a twofold mission. Help store owners improve their business and help the communities that the stores are in. And how do we help fulfill these two missions? We help Sari Sari store owners grow their business by a combination of three things. Providing training, access to capital through microfinance, and providing them new business opportunities. Specifically now around technology, which we could get into a little bit later. Right. So that entire quote-unquote package or intervention suite is designed specifically so that the store owner to grow their business, increase their income, thereby allowing them to provide more for their family. Now, the other side of that, a happy byproduct or adjacent byproduct is that the kind of businesses that we encourage the store owner to get into should have direct and tangible benefits to their communities. So let me be very concrete about this. So in the past several years, we've done quite a lot of things as new business offerings to our store owners. So one, we've gone, of course, the basic one, which would be grocery items at lower yeah. prices. Yeah. So that's a check. We've done solar charging stations. We've done that in around 20 communities. The store owner is able to do a solar charging business, but for the community that doesn't have electricity, uh -huh. it provides access to light. Right. Nine. We've done a partnership with a generics company and Unilab to distribute over-the-counter medicine. So that one is a new business opportunity. Buy a Sari Sari? Buy a Sari Sari store, over-the-counter medicine. Actually, that for the Nanai, that's a new business. Yep. Uh, over-the-counter medicine. And of course, we had to partner with DOH, the Pharmacists Association, etc. But for the community, it's now access to medicine because when we studied it, some of the stores are carrying it, but it's very expensive. It's like 20-30% more. But if you cut that entire chain, then suddenly medicine is more affordable. The stores are more educated. And now people have access to over-the-counter medicine. Another concrete example is Remitan. So we oh, went into Smart Padala, part of Smart. And so it's, again, similar. For a store owner, it's a new business package. They're able to offer now a remittance service at the Sari Sari store level. But what that means ultimately to the community is that they can now get the padala at a much cheaper rate. So just to give an idea, the average padala is around a thousand pesos. Normally, if you go into town to get that remittance, it would cost you around probably 17%. So if helper fillers in the city sends it to a relative back home, if they send 1,000, the recipient gets around 830 pesos. But if you do it through Smart Padala or through a Happy Noise store, it goes down to around 5 6%. So that's significant. It's really help nanais and sari sari stores grow their business, build this network of stores, and as we have this network of stores, introduce businesses that could benefit the communities of these stores. It's retail and distribution platform. So later, I, I want to talk a little bit about the major initiative that we have, which is now around technology. You're able to, to give these advantages to Sari Sari owners thanks to economies of scale, or are you yeah. getting grants or loans yeah. from, from somewhere? How does yeah. that work? So, well, in terms of the capital, uh, so it's still a mixture. So we're a hybrid enterprise. So we have a for-profit arm that does the works with donations and grants that goes into all the training capacity building for our store owners. And then there's a for-profit side of Happy Noi that makes money of all the new businesses that we engaged the store owners on. So when we distributed the medicine, got a percentage of that. When we sold groceries, we sold a charging station, there's a percentage that we get out of that. The padala, we get a small percentage of that. And so, so that's how it works. So there's training that's funded by supporters. There's capital provided by microfinance institutions. And then the for-profit side makes its revenue from a share of the businesses that we offer through our store owners. Okay. And how do you find that right balance between making enough profit for yourself to be a sustainable business and at the 
the same time, of course, making it fair to the Saudi Saudis. Because you could even look at microfinance, right? Yeah. And it was started, and I think Mohammed Yunus had great intention, and I think he's actually achieved wonderful things. But there yeah. are people that have come on board and done yeah. microfinance and taken advantage of the Absolutely. Uh, how did you get that right? That right yeah, balance? so absolutely. And I think in the microfinance industry, not just, well, not locally, but uh, all around the world, that has become an issue okay. precisely because it's been able to show commercial returns. And so right. the capitalists sniffed it and sort of like mm-hmm. uh, have, to a certain extent, exploited it. I think what's very, very important is that we remain very, very clear about our priorities. For us, generating revenues, generating profits are really just a means to an end in order to support our store owners. So there's never been a discussion on how we could maximize or exploit you know, the money that's made out of this whole endeavor. But I think a lot of that goes back to very clear about what the mission is and make very, very sure that your board and your investors are all aligned towards that. So I think we're very blessed in the sense that our board, our co-founders, and our investors that have come on board are very aligned on that. We're not shy about saying that we want to make money, right. but making money is a means to an end, really. And that means to an end, that end really is how do we help support, help grow uh, the business of our nanites? And at the same time, how do we help support their company? In your um, journey as a social entrepreneur, and I know this, but I still have to ask you because I think more people should know this. Um, what are the things that surprised you? Like the challenges that surprised you? Because there are usual challenges, right? That we expect. But there are challenges that are like, huh, I didn't think of this when we were starting. I think I've always had a mindset that we have to adapt. And so surprises are par for the course. Right. If you don't expect surprises, then at some point you're going to shrivel. And in our history, we've always known that we had to constantly evolve. I mean, I mentioned a lot of businesses that we've been in. So our core pillars have always been the same. It's always been about training, microfinance, and new business opportunities to help the store grow their business. And these businesses should also benefit their community. So that's always what it's been about. But in the delivery of that, in the tactics of that, and the kind of businesses that we've offered, we've gone into over-the-counter medicine, we've gone into solar, we've gone into, well, in our first model, it was about distribution of goods. You know, what happens is that just because you're a social enterprise doesn't mean you get a free pass of what's happening in the market. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you're shielded from market forces. I think sometimes social entrepreneurs or social enterprises have this sort of like feeling that I am doing good. So I exist in a bubble that the market forces are not allowed to affect me because I'm doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Why should I be beholden to market forces when I have such a, you know, such a worthwhile <laughs> mission? When Pure Gold opened in a lot of our areas, they could offer the same thing, even cheaper and at larger scale. Then basically overnight, it's sort of like, You don't have a business in distribution. But you have to go back to what's your core business. Our core business was never about distributing grocery items. Our core business has always been about how do we help the nanas grow their stores? And how can we offer businesses that benefit the community? And if you stay true to that, then you realize you're not in the grocery business. You're not in the solar business. You're not in the -the over-the-counter medicine business. You're in the business of coming up with new initiatives that will allow the store to perpetuate, uh, to continue. And if you stay true to that, you allow yourself to evolve. And evolution is part of it. Social entrepreneurs, social enterprises have to evolve. Companies are disrupted all the time. Social enterprises are not exempt from this reality. And you started Happy No Idea were a bunch of you, right? Four or yeah. five of you, one of them Bamakino? Yes. Yeah. Right. Are those people that you started Happy Noi with, are they still involved today? Or yeah. are, are you the sort of the main figurehead of the business? Yeah. Uh, it's actually a large head of group of people. It's actually nine of us that started it. Nine co-founders. Nine co-founders. Nine I mean, co-founders. Not, not too many cooks in Yeah. The... We didn't know, I mean, how these things work out in the beginning. But, you know, we're quite lucky because I mentioned earlier that alignment around the table is extremely important. And so, but I guess to contextualize these nine people, so two of those would be myself and Bam. I guess we would be the, the young guns. And then, I'm not saying they're old, sorry, yeah, board members say. or co-founders, <laughs> but maybe like a generation. Yeah. Not, not even very, a full generation. As well, right? A few not? years, but definitely very, very established established people. I mean, like, you know, our first chairman was Rapa Lopa, formerly the executive director of the Philippine Business for Social Progress. Actually, okay. Bam's second cousin, nephew of former president Corazon Aquino. Our vice chairman and founding partners, Dr. Aris Ali, founder of Card MRI, which is the largest microfinance institution in the Philippines. He's, he's the Philippines' Dr. Yunus, and he's actually in the book that uh-huh. I read, Banker to the Poor. And so there's Manny De Luna, which was my former boss in Unilever. They were pretty much very established people with very established companies that they've started, or NGOs, or development organizations that they've started. So these nine people, two ways to cut it. One is like Bam and I are the young guns. So pretty much we're given the ball to run with from the very beginning. So pretty much we've been the ones tasked to do things and our board, these other seven, would really be providing strategic and of course top level guidance. Bam 
obviously had really the public service inclination ever since. You're also a co-founder of Frags to Riches, and we also have nine founders. Yes. And I, I hyperventilate a little every time I think about how many people um, we have to answer to or we have to coordinate with. Uh, and yeah. you and me are very different. So I am definitely more stubborn. It's hard for me to listen to feedback right away, but I noticed that, and, I've, and I know this, I've witnessed this throughout our relationship, working and as husband and wife that you're very collaborative, that you are working with partners for you is very natural. So I, I want to get a few tips from you on working with mm. collaborators, with partners, with how many people that you're working with right now. Because I think for people who want to start doing good as a social entrepreneur, you're never going to do it alone. No matter what happens, you'll have people mm. to work with. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, well, first, I wouldn't recommend starting with, I mean, even with <laughs> what you said, I really wouldn't recommend starting with nine people. I mean, I think personally, I'm just very lucky with what happened in Happy Noy. These nine founding partners are such a joy to be, to be with. And in terms of the question on collaboration, I've always had that mindset that if you think that you can get at it alone, then you won't go very far. And it's been said a lot, but if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I've always had that mindset that there's always like a tapestry or a puzzle. And you're one piece of that puzzle. And and you kind of have to be very, very clear what piece of that puzzle you are. And then you have to sort of like figure out what are the other pieces around that tapestry. And that's the way I view part. Sometimes it can be a very tiring process, but the way I always piece it together is that, okay, this is me and this is what I'm good at and this is what I'm not so good at. These are the things I know and these are the things I don't know. And so like, how do I sort of like jujitsu and like get the best out of different partners and stakeholders by still, this only works if you have a very clear vision and direction because the danger of this is that you're going to get pulled into a hundred million directions. Yeah. So I would only recommend being very collaborative if the end goal is clear to you and clear to the other partners. For example, working with our partner, Microfinance Institution, part working with CARD, uh, working with Activasia, uh, working with PBSP, working with you know all of these different pieces. And that's not just on a personal level with me and my board. That's also how I consider Happy Noise, Happy Noise as a social enterprise. Again, if you start believing that your social enterprise alone is going to solve everything, then you're going to be in trouble. You have to be very clear about what your role is in that ecosystem. So like Happy Noy, we're very, very focused that we will work with micro entrepreneurs. We will work with Sari Sari Star owners. We will be a distribution and retail platform. We are not going to develop the products because that's not our core competency. If you have a great product that we could bring around to Sari Sari stores, we'd gladly bring that into the store platform, but we will stick to what we're good at. You and Reeves were both quite lucky in having so many partners from the yeah. outset. I know quite a few social entrepreneurs in this country, they're really struggling because they're on their own and they can't find those reliable partners to help them build their business. What would you say to either one of those aspiring social entrepreneurs or somebody who is just listening into the podcast and has maybe a nice idea or a dream of starting something? And it's like, how on earth do you find, whether it be four other people, two other people, or even a eight or nine people like you did who, who can form that team. How do you go? So let me start by saying that, and this might sound, I really think that if the mission is true and if the vision is clear, then there's a natural serendipity that will happen. I think there's like an invisible hand called God at work that will really sort of like bring people together. Right. And that's been my personal experience with happiness. But let me concretize that because some people might find that, oh, touchy-feely, so mm. intangible. But I really do believe that because what happens is that if you want to, I talked about wanting to talk about reading the book and Banker to the Poor and, and I was like, wow, I, one day I hope that work with a group as great as Grameen and true enough, who would have thought that I would end up not just working with Card, but you know, having Dr. Aleph as a co-founder, founding partner of Happy Noy. I mean, that was like beyond conception. So some people might say, oh, but he knew BAM. Obviously uh, helpful. But what's interesting about Happy Noy that when we got together, it was actually serendipitously through my former boss, Manny, which was a bit further out from, from BAM. But of course, with BAM there, it made things a lot easier. But, but so I think I really believe it, that there's a certain serendipity that yeah. you attract. But to be concrete about it, you also have to put a lot of work in. You know, when I resigned from Unilever, one of my biggest fears was, I don't know how to be an entrepreneur. And that's a real yeah. fear. And again, I guess you can sense I'm sort of like being a nerd. So how do you sort of like solve that piece of the equation? You, you need to find good mentors. And what I would suggest to a lot of people out there is that just randomly reach out to people. You'd be surprised how much they're willing to help. So I made a rule when I resigned that every month I will reach out to some person that I have read about randomly and just connect. And talk to them, tell them what I'm trying to do, and see if there's like a point of consonance. And believe you me, so many people would just respond. Jay Bernardo, the entrepreneurship guru, I bumped into a trip in China, and then I just emailed him, and then he took me 
you know, with him for a few months. And then eventually I actually taught in his class. I read an article and I was very fascinated about the creative economy. I read an article that Henny Schumacher, the, one of the heads of the European Chamber of Commerce wrote in Business World. And it's like, okay, anybody here interested? Email me. And I emailed him and then he and we had lunch. And I didn't know him from Adam. Mm. You would be surprised how many people are willing to help. Now, doesn't mean that they're going to meet with you yet tomorrow. Yeah. But there will be a common time. And these people are very, very busy. But you'd be surprised that, you know, some of them will, will answer. So it's serendipity, but it's not just going to happen with it's you sitting passive. on your backside watching exactly. TV, right? <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. I mean, you've got to go out there and prove that you're really yeah. interested and committed to doing something. And you'll naturally meet the right people exactly uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about the technology yeah. that you're looking to implement with um, with the Sari Sari stores I mean my own experience yeah. of Sari Sari stores and the nanites that I deal with yeah. uh, you know that I get my load from for yeah. my mobile phone is yeah. they don't have the most you know updated yeah. <laughs> te technological gadgets yes so how are you using tech to help them I mentioned earlier that you have to be conscious of what's going on around you and that you don't operate in a vacuum and so when you look at the environment now especially the Sari Sari store environment which is pretty much very well steeped in the retail environment in the distribution environment and then you look at these trends you're looking at convenience stores rapidly expanding you're looking at the modernization of retail you've got now a number of players here 7-eleven is expanding Alpha Mart is here Family Mart is here Lawson's is here and again don't get me wrong I don't think these are bad things in themselves I think it's in fact a very good sign of the Philippine economy growing so I take that as a positive sign. But as the co-founder of Happy Noy, I have to think about yeah. our Sari Sari store owners. And again, the way we think is that you don't shield them from this reality. The challenge really is how do we help our nanas level up and compete yeah. with all of these like big players? The other major trend that's going to change everything is e-commerce. Right. Now, this won't happen immediately in rural areas. It is changing the landscape in urban areas. And it's just a matter of time before it expands. These are two big trends. And when we became cognizant of that uh, a couple of years ago, then we said we have to prepare the stores for this new reality. And the game changer, we believe, is really... And, and you're right. Technology is not, especially smartphone technology, mobile technology, is not second nature. That will naturally happen if you, if you ask me. The thing is, we believe it will happen. The transition or adoption might happen too late. And so what we're trying to do is to accelerate it especially amongst our store network. What do we see as the input or the, the benefits of Anana using a smartphone or a tablet? If before, the major components really were you have a store owner and you have a physical Sari Sari store, and then there are distributors or wholesalers that they could buy and sell grocery from, you could totally expand what they're able to sell if you allow them to adopt technology. So we're trying to blend mobile technology into the things that the store could, could sell. And we're taking it step by step by step in a very disciplined way. So we started out by, I mentioned we worked with Smart uh, Padala. We saw the potential in that. But we saw how we could make that even more efficient by getting the nanas on smartphones and getting them to an app called Bismo. So right. we have an app, you could check it out on Google Play, but only our nanas would be able to access it, though. You'd need the username. And using Bismo and a smartphone and a mobile money wallet, the Nana can now start offering a lot of new services. There's, of course, airtime loading, uh, which you experience. So mm -hmm. using an app, it's going to be a lot more frictionless. It's going to yep. be a lot easier for Nana. Sending money is going to be a lot easier. Receiving money is going to be a lot easier. Using this Bismo, Nana can also sell microinsurance. So it's a 40 peso microinsurance that would cover the customer for six months, accident and death. 40%? Uh, uh, 40, 40 pesos. pesos. It's just for 40 pesos. They cover for, for six, a month? Uh, no, for six months. So these are the things that, you know, I always talk about new business for Nana and something that benefits their customers. And then now the main thing that we're very excited about is blending e-commerce into the store. Now we have, we've opened it up that the nanas can start selling appliances. Now we could go debate the consumerist thing that we're sort of like getting into. Pretty much people want to buy an electric fan. People want to buy a smartphone. Yeah. People want to buy a television set. And so why not provide them access to that? And so we now have, through Bismo, a facility whereby the nanas can sell Appliances. It blows the Nana's mind because whereas before, the only thing they could sell was what you could see in the store. Mm. But now anything that is online, they could sell. But how does that work? I yeah. mean, I can't show up at a Sari Sari store and see the plasma TV I want to buy. These, you see it in their phone. That's why there's going to be this transition point. But you have to understand that the key here is that the Nana's are trusted members of the... And that's really the key. So like Filipinos, especially around Sari Sari stores, would prefer to deal with a physical face. Nana's have different tactics to sort of like weave this in. Like, mm -hmm. of course, we have all the merchandise and materials. Appliances now available on installment in the Happiness store. But they sort of like weave it in. Your neighbor, Kapit Bahay, noticed that uh -huh. to kind of get a summer, like they wanted a 
electric fan, by the way. And then they even, you know, I, I'm selling electric fans now. Uh, do you want to see the models? And then brings out her phone or her tablet. Anything here? And then she orders. Knows her customers better than uh, exactly better than someone in a big store. Exactly. Right? And, and interviewed some of these customers. People are actually aware of these online stores. Yeah, I know Lazada. And they're like, but why do you still buy from Nani? Because if the item arrives and it's broken, who do I chase? Mm. I go to Tita Myri. And it also means, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, all it needs is, particularly in more rural areas, yeah. one person to have access to that technology yes. to benefit uh, everybody. everybody in that barangay, right? Yeah, As exactly. opposed to with Lazada, you yourself need to have yeah. uh, you know, access to yeah. Lazada and a mm. credit card or however it is. Exactly. Internet Payment access. So yeah. we're, we're solving the pain points on both sides of the equation. So the pain points on the customer side really are, I might have a smartphone, but I'm not connected to the internet. I might have a smartphone and I'm connected to the internet, but I don't have a credit card. I might have a smartphone, I might be connected to the internet, I might have a credit card, but I don't trust an online store. Yeah. Get all of that, you go to a store that you trust, would have a mobile phone connected to the internet, has a mobile money wallet, so can send the payment over to us digitally. On the supplier side, whether that, because we're working with the different suppliers here, what happens is that they would prefer, especially as you go outside Metro Manila, that the orders are aggregated. So that's a pain point. So like, rather than going around to so many houses, you just drop it off in a happy nice store. And the other side that's a major pain point, and we know this from online sales, is that collection is a pain. So like, how do you get the money? So of course, there's cash and delivery by all of these logistics providers. It's a very cash and delivery market in the Philippines. But here, it's the store doing the collection for mm. you. So you're solving on the supply side the problems on logistics consolidation and payments collection. And of course, the full access to, to your catalog. For our listeners, almost all of them know and probably really appreciate their local Sari Sari store yeah. owner. From my own experience, right? Yeah. Just, yeah. just yesterday, I was going to get a bottle of water and a lovely lady, and she comes up with the same joke every single time yeah. I go. She goes, no sleepo, no sleep. <laughs> just because yeah. I'm just because yeah. I'm ordering a bottle of water. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Uh, she's such a, a, great, <laughs> a, a great lady. Uh, anyway, I slightly I digress. We all know a local Sari Sari store owner. For anybody who's listening, how could they get involved? Is there any way they could get involved in, in Happy Noi? Is there any way in which they could introduce Happy Noi to that lovely lady that runs the Sari Sari store that, that they always go to every single morning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, we're always looking for more stores to be able to partner with, uh, more nanais or more tatais in certain cases. So our primary areas of operation are Southern Luzon, now also around NCR. We have a strong presence also in Samar and Leyte. So send us a note info at happynui.com uh -huh. now we're quite getting a bit of inquiries and applications online so they just send us a note and then we'll see how we could partner with them but and here's the critical point we've come to the realization that we cannot help every single target and so that's why now we're very conscious that we support and partner with what we call growth oriented stores these are not large stores but there has to be a certain inclination that the store owner must want to grow. And we've done this already very systematically, got this math genius to sort of like do correlations. Basically 19 questions that would sort of like assess if this store is growth oriented. And the reason we had to do this is because, you know, we do a bunch of training and I mentioned our foundation gets grants to do the training. And one of the things we saw was that quite a lot of the Sari Sari stores who joined the training, after six months, nine months, 12 months, they say, I want to do something else. We just want to make sure that these resources are used very responsibly. So we want to funnel all of the training support to nanais or tatais or store owners that do want to continue this, that do want to grow their store. Your path towards doing good or towards becoming a social entrepreneur is from a corporate job. So a lot of people would probably be fresh graduates or some are in the middle of their careers or at the height of their careers. And what would you tell the younger Mark who just left corporate and what to expect, the things he should look out for, or, you know, just things to inspire him to just keep going? Although you're still here, so you're still inspired. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, there's been a ton of mistakes in the past 10 years, and there's been a ton of problems that I've had to deal with. And again, we really don't want to paint this over-romanticized picture of what being a social entrepreneur is. I mean, personally, because otherwise, when people get into it, then they get disappointed, and then that's when they give up, and then they fall somewhere else. A mentality already that it's going to be a tough road. I would just say that your fears were warranted. <laughs> 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 you still have to stick through it, and when I look at it, you know, those mistakes, those hardships, all those struggles. I didn't undergo these struggles or problems or mistakes. I don't think I would be left worse off than I am now because now I'm benefiting from 10 years worth of mistakes and struggles and problems. And so I would say embrace the problems that are on your way because 
they will help you become a better person. Does it help having a wife is also a social entrepreneur? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, you have to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, absolutely. <laughs> Seriously, it's like, you know, a lot of people always say like, are you both crazy? There's somebody who told me actually that there should be a rule uh, with a couple that only one person in a startup, the other one in a stable job. Yeah. Marry someone who shares the vision but doesn't fund the mission. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Fund the mission. And then, yeah. yeah, exactly. No, we're both like, exactly. no. Yeah, but like, but I don't think I would have it any other way because otherwise, being a social entrepreneur is a tough job. And you need to be with a person who not only understands it conceptually, but can feel it very visceral. Otherwise, it's gonna break you apart. And so, you know, the sleepless nights we've both undergone in our enterprises is something we've shared. And we don't, you know, berate each other over it because we both literally understand what that's like. He's behaved quite well, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah he has. You were a bit he, worried he, he was going to be singing he, Hamilton. He, yeah. he oh, we could get back will. to that. We could get yeah, back to that. that. No, we couldn't. Yeah, yeah. no, we wouldn't. And yeah, because originally my plan out. was to answer all questions with titles of Hamilton songs. Or with a British accent. Oh, with a British accent. <laughs> Tia, no, 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 you spent a good few minutes of your life listening to us, and we would love to hear from you too. We're always looking for inspiring stories of people who are doing good from wherever they are. So we'd love it if you could share these stories with us. Send us a message through Facebook or Instagram. You can find us by searching for In Good Company Podcast on Facebook or at In Good Company PH on Instagram. This podcast is brought to you by Mad Travel, Rags to Riches, and Things That Matter. Hosted by me, Tom Graham, and Reese Fernandez Ruiz. This podcast is edited by our awesome intern, Alemi Pagulayan, with research and marketing done by Romano Santos. And let's not forget the music, which comes from Kevin McCloud. And finally, this podcast would not be possible without you, our listeners and advocates. We really are in good company with you. Until next time.